All right, thanks, Tyler. Uh, could you turn your Bibles uh, to Daniel chapter 1, verse 1? Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. Let's take a moment of silent prayer before we get underway. And uh, I look around, you guys know what to do. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for this time to study your word and to uh, study the book of Daniel. We thank you for the things that we've been learning in the book of Daniel. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to guide us and direct us in this study. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that we have uh, in the temporal realm and the spiritual realm. We thank you, Father, for giving us logistically everything that we need uh, in the temporal realm to do your will. We thank you for all the blessings that we have that are associated or the direct result of our union and identification with your son, Jesus Christ, our marriage to him. And we just uh, thank you, Father, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that he would work, do a mighty work here this evening. And we just pray, Father, through the power of the Spirit, that you could help me to uh, deliver your full counsel to your people with, in a fashion that would minister to your people and to bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ, to do this with power and to do this with reverence and respect for your word sensitivity to the Spirit's guidance and direction. We also pray for the audience, that the audience, the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through them, that uh, everyone would have objectivity and humility and sensitivity as well to the Spirit's guidance and direction. We pray that each individual would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment and would take these things that we're learning in the book of Daniel and bring them into their daily lives so that they can bring glory to you, Father, and uh, they, they could grow up to spiritual maturity. And so, Father, we also thank you for uh, Titus and uh, Tyler and their work uh, with the sound and the recordings. We just pray, Father, for uh, them this evening that everything would go smoothly with the technology. And uh, we just pray, Father, that you would give wisdom to them. And we pray that as a result of this Bible class, we'd have a great time fellowshipping in your word, continuing to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 is where you should all be. This evening we're going to, we're approaching uh, very rapidly the end of chapter 1. This evening we're going to note Daniel 1.18 which records Ashpenaz presenting Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah uh, to Nebuchadnezzar after they completed the three-year training program to prepare them to serve as dignitaries in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. That'll be our subject here this evening. Let's pick it up in Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and, the no and of the nobles, youths in whom there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration, from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank. And he appointed and he appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. So Daniel 1.18 is going to get us to that point where they, they had completed the training, the three-year training program at the Royal Academy in Babylon. Look at verse 6. Now among them, from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials, Ashpenaz, assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. 
Now, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. Verse 14, so he listened to them in this matter. He agreed with them and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter, as we saw, healthier. Their bodies, are, bodies were healthier than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food, the other ex Israelite exiles. So the overseer, verse 16, continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these youths, God gave them uh, knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the phrase in verse 18, that at the end, then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for, for, for presenting them, is composed of the conjunction wa, which is translated here, then. And then it's followed by a prepositional phrase, the preposition lamed, which is translated at, and it's, uh, then we have the preposition min, and its object is the noun ketsoth, which is the tr translated here, the end of. Then we have the word for days, it's in the plural form, it's the word yom, and this is followed by the relative particle asher translated here correctly which and then we have a verb we have the cal active perfect form of the verb ama which is translated in this passage had specified by the new american standard and this is followed by the articular form of the noun malek as we've seen it often it's referring to nebuchadnezzar it's translated here correctly the king and then lastly we have the prepositional phrase preposition lamed translated for and its object is the hithel infinitive construct form of the verb bow which is translated here presenting and then we have the third person masculine plural pronomial suffix hema which is translated them here correctly and it's referring to daniel and his three companions now the conjunction wa which is translated here then it actually should be translated when uh, it uh, because it's a temporal marker and that means it, it denotes that when the days of Daniel uh, the, when the days of training Daniel and his three friends in the literature and language of the Chaldeans had been completed these four Daniel and his three companions were presented to Nebuchadnezzar by Ashpenaz his officials commander and as we'll see tomorrow evening in, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to interview them and on several different occasions as we'll see he interviews them and he finds them superior to the other Israelite exiles. Uh, so we have here that word then should be translated in a temporal sense. It's a temporal marker. It's telling us that when the days of training Daniel and his three friends in the literature and language of the Chaldeans had been completed, these four were presented to Nebuchadnezzar, meaning they entered his presence. Ashpenaz brought them into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. Now the word Ketzah, translated here the end of, that word is correctly translated. It refers to the end of the three-year training program mentioned in Daniel chapter 1 verse 5, which we just read. Now this three-year Babylonian education resembled a modern graduate uh, school training program, which further indicates that these young Israelites were not young teenagers. So uh, the fact that they would be in this three-year training program, which was, uh, we know from uh, other secular writings from Babylon, that this was uh, equivalent to a, a uh, in our day and age, to a graduate uh, tr school training program. And so this is the idea. So these individuals, Daniel and his three companions, uh, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they weren't little boys. Uh, they, were not yet, they were not 13, 14, or 12 years old. Uh, they were actually young adults. They were young men. The word yaled, as we've been noting in this chapter, translated used by the New American Standard, is actually should be rendered young men. So Daniel and his three companions 
along with the rest of the, uh, the these exiles here, the the uh, fr- brought over uh, the, brought over from uh, Israel by the Babylonians to take part in this training program, and who met the qualifications listed in verse four, uh, they were all around 17, 18, 19 years of age. So let's say Daniel started this program at seventeen. Uh, or 18, so he was done with the program around uh, 20, 21 years of age. So the, this this fact that uh, this three-year training program is an, another indication that Daniel and his three companions were not little boys. They were young men. Now, those who met the qualifications, those who meet the qualifications listed in Daniel 1.4, which we read, would be trained in Babylonian culture, mathematics, astrology, astronomy, science, agriculture, philosophy, Uh, medicine, military history and tactics, Babylonian history, as well as training in Babylonian government and law. It was quite extensive. So first of all, you had to be well-educated to get in this program, and then it was an an intense program that they endured or experienced or took part in for three years. And again, this was to acclimate uh, these Israelite exiles, and Daniel and his three companions were among these exiles. It was to assimilate them into Babylonian culture. It was also to get them educated in Babylonian, Babylonian literature and language because Nebuchadnezzar wanted these guys to serve in his government. So if they don't know how to speak uh, the, uh, the language and don't know the literature of the Babylonians, and that would include their laws. And remember, in Nebuchadnezzar, we saw in the introduction, and then also in chapter 1, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, as we know from secular writings and things that we've, inscriptions that we found and, and documents we found from Babylon's ancient history, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a, a great lawgiver and a great builder. He was a genius himself, and he wanted geniuses surrounding him. He wanted to have the best of, his, of the best, and he wasn't so much concerned uh, with morality or character. In that sense, he was looking for someone who was very intelligent, somebody who could further his kingdom, who could uh, uh, contribute to his kingdom and the glory of his kingdom. So this was a, a big ego thing in a, se- in a sense, not just uh, something that he was trying to do to enhance his nation's stature in the world. Now, upon completion of this three-year training program, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah would be brought into Nebuchadnezzar's presence, and they would serve as dignitaries for the king. So they were going to be in high uh, echelons of government. Uh, so this was a great deal. We've been bringing this out in chapter 1. You, as, if you're going to get taken captive by a foreign power, uh, this is one of the best things that could ever happen to you, is that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't mistreat you. They don't, Babylonians don't mistreat you and uh, you know, uh, brutalize you or rape you or uh, 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 make you a eunuch and uh, castrate you, which was often the case. Uh, with young men uh, when they were uh, when they were t- uh, when their nat- when their country was overrun by a foreign power instead the uh, Daniel and his three companions who were uh, part of the nobility in Judea in Israel uh, they had a great situation here they went from being nobles and in royalty in Israel and were becoming and were royalty or in a sense nobility and uh, in Babylon so they had a great great situation here for them and so it was, uh, you couldn't have asked for a better situation because now they're going to go from being high up in Israelite society to being high up in Babylonian society. And so this is the idea of what's going on here. Nebuchadnezzar wants to train these guys. He wants to have, him, have them involved in this uh, three-year training program because he wants them to be dignitaries. He wants them to serve in his government. And again, it's for pres- uh, anything that make his government uh, the uh, the pride uh, something make them uh, his government uh, the uh, the most powerful in the world the most uh, containing the best and the brightest uh, that the world could offer so again upon completion of this three year training program Daniel and his three companions would be brought into Nebuchadnezzar's presence and would serve as dignitaries for the king it's interesting when we get to chapter two uh, the uh, d- among the dignitaries are are uh, Nebuchadnezzar's wise men. And it's interesting who their wise, his wise men were. They were occult priests. They were necromancers, meaning they try to communicate with the dead. They were witches. They practiced witchcraft. And they were also astrologers uh, that were in, in, in involved in these, uh, that helped to compose the, uh, the dignitaries in Nebuchadnezzar's government. And so this is p- quite interesting uh, that uh, ne- uh, Daniel and his three companions, now they're God, uh, you know, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they're godly men, and now they're going to be rubbing elbows with men who actually are communicating with demons. 
as we'll see when we study in chapter 2. So Daniel and his three companions are going to have interaction with these men, the necromancers in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, occult priests, astrologers, uh, the, and also the uh, necromancers speaking, uh, trying to communicate with the dead. And these individuals were all demonically inspired and were actually having communication with, with demons because that's what happens when you're involved, like the uh, people who are involved in the occult, they're actually coming in contact with demonic activity, d the demons themselves. So here's Daniel and his three companions, godly men, and now they're going to be uh, uh, butting heads with these individuals who are basically inspired by the devil. And what's interesting also when we get to chapter 2 is that, uh, that Daniel, he has every opportunity to have these guys put to death, but he ha doesn't have them put to death. He shows them grace, uh, which is quite interesting, and we'll note that as we get, uh, when we get to that chapter in the next couple of weeks. Now, it says in, uh, in Daniel 1.18, it says, Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for, for presenting them, the commander of the officials, Ashpenaz, presented Daniel and his three companions before Nebuchadnezzar. The word days, as we saw, is the word yom, and it's referring to the three-year training program that the young Israelite men who met the qualifications listed in Daniel 1.4 would undergo in order to operate in the capacity of dignitaries for Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the word days here, it means, it's referring to that three-year training program. How do we know? Well, that the word speaks of this three-year period is indicated by the statement in Daniel 1.5, which I pointed out when we were reading it, which states, that verse states, that those young Israelite men who met the qualifications listed in Daniel 1.4 would take part in a three-year training program in order to be educated in the Babylonian literature and language. So the statement in verse 5 is telling us that the word days here and verse 18 is referring to that three-year training program. Now the word for the, the that's translated the end of Ketsoth, it's the object of the preposition lamed, as I noted before a few moments ago. That word, that preposition marks the completion of the three-year training program for Daniel and his three friends. Now the pre preposition min that follows it means when, because this word loses its own force when it's preceded by the preposition lamed. So thus, this word, this preposition min, it is marking a statement that tells the reader when Daniel and his three companions were presented to Nebuchadnezzar by Ashpenaz. Now the word for king, that word it says uh, at the end, in verse uh, 18, at the end of the days, which the king had specified for them. The word king there is Melech. It's referring, of course, to Nebuchadnezzar. And the word Melech means that he was the governmental head of Babylon. Now, don't miss this. When we studied verse 1, uh, we studied verse 1. We saw this in the introduction. Uh, Nabopolassar was his father, and he was the first, uh, uh, he was the first uh, uh, ruler of the Neo-Babylonian period. Nebuchadnezzar was the second who followed him. Now remember, when Nebuchadnezzar attacked in 605 B.C., when he attacked uh, Judea, when he went after Jerusalem, besieged it in 605 B.C., uh, we noted that uh, on the throne was his father. And then his father died while he was un uh, laying siege to Jerusalem. And he took off and went back to Babylon. And he assumed the, the crown there, consult did everything he needed to do there in, in Babylon, and came back later, about a month later, and took the reins again and, fin and uh, 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 basically finished up the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the attack on Jerusalem. So his father died in the middle of the siege of Jerusalem. And then Yemuk Nebuchadnezzar assumed the crown at that particular time. And Nebuchadnezzar, again, is a brilliant man. Now, it's, it doesn't surprise me, and it shouldn't surprise you as the reader, that Nebuchadnezzar would be a brilliant man because he's asking, he wants to have these guys, he wants people around him, he wants to surround himself with very intelligent people. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, even uh, secular history tells us, was a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, he, as I said before, we know from uh, certain inscriptions, writings that we found uh, in the Neo-Babylonian period, in which Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of, we saw that he was a, uh, he was a great law giver. Uh, he was very much, uh, uh, he had a, a law code he had, he had uh, uh, developed, and he was, so he was brilliant in that area, and we know he's brilliant in a military sense, because he, he, he taught, dominated the ancient world while he was alive. In fact, Daniel and God said to Daniel in, in the dream that he gave Nebuchadnezzar that Nebuchadnezzar was 
a big big deal. He was the first great world em- uh, Gentile world empire that uh, is mentioned in that that uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had from God about the f- the times of the Gentiles. So Nebuchadnezzar was a brilliant brilliant individual, and so he's going to surround himself with brilliant individuals. Now the word that's translated it says uh, in verse eighteen. Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them. The word had specified is uh, actually the word amar. It's a verb. And uh, this word actually means command. And I say that it should be translated not specified but commanded is because the statement to follow refers to the statements in Daniel 1, 3 through 5, which records that Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz to bring to Babylon certain qualified Israelites who were of noble and royal descent in order to train them for three years to serve in his royal court. So uh, the word Amma, if you look at verse 8 of 18, then at the end of the days which the king had ordered, is what we should say, or commanded for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. Now the statements in verses 3, 4, and 5 tell us, uh, record us for us, that Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz to bring to Babylon certain qualified uh, Israelites who were of noble and royal descent in order to train them for three years to serve in his royal court. So the statements in those three verses, three, four, and five, is showing an order that Nebuchadnezzar gave to Ashpenaz to have these guys, these Israelite, qualified Israelite men, young men, to be uh, undergo this three-year training program. It was an order. It was a command. So it shouldn't be translated specified. In fact, while I'm at it, why don't I give you my translation of verse 18, my interpretive translation, which reflects my interpretation of these verses. It says in uh, verse 18 in my translation, it says, when at when at the completion of the days which the king had pre- commanded to present them, the official's commander then presented them in the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. So the word ama had specified should be rendered command. Now the verb bo that's translated present, it's correctly translated. It's, uh, it's, it denotes that Ashpenaz introduced Daniel and his three companions into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. So they were being introduced to the king of Babylon. That's what the word present there is talking about. He's introducing them, leading them into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. And them, of course, is referring to Daniel and his three companions. Now the phrase uh, in verse 18 that's translated, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar is composed of the conjunction wa. It's not translated, and it should be. It uh, should be translated next or then. Now, then we have the verb. We have the hithel imperfect form of the verb bo, which again is translated here, presented like it did earlier in the verse. It's correctly translated. Then again, we have the word for them is hema, correctly translated, referring to Daniel and his three companions again. And the word for commander is saw, and that's uh, modified by the articular form of the noun saris, the officials, uh, which is it's translated the officials. Then it, the, it, comp- it completes, uh, it's, this uh, phrase is completed with a prepositional phrase that begins with a preposition lamed, and its object is the word panah, translated before, and then we have the word for Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and that word is translated here uh, correctly, Nebuchadnezzar. Now the word that's not translated in this verse, it says the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. There's a word that the New American Standard's not translating, the conjunction wa. And this word wa is introducing a statement which records an event that took place after Daniel and his three companions had completed the three-year training program. So this word is saying, okay, after they finished it, then this is what happened. After they finished the three-year training program, then this is what happened. The New American Standard leaves it out, no big deal. At the right, it's pretty uh, well implied what's going on here. So this word, wa, which is not translated, is introducing a statement which says that Daniel and his three companions were presented to Nebuchadnezzar by Ashpenaz, which took place immediately after these four had completed the three-year training program. The word sar, translated commander, is modified by the word saris, officials, and this is referring, these two words are referring to Ashpenaz. It denotes that he was the overseer, the commander of Nebuchadnezzar's officials. So that means he's kind of like the chief of staff. He's the guy Everybody uh, is, uh, he's the buffer between Nebuchadnezzar and everybody else that is uh, in in Nebuchadnezzar's government. So this is a pretty good job. And it's interesting that his is a very important position. This man's got a great position in Nebuchadnezzar's government. 
and he has been given this task to oversee, uh, watch over these, these young Israelite men and oversee their training, the three-year training program in, in the literature and language of the Babylonians. And so that means that Nebuchadnezzar really valued uh, this training program of these young Israelite men because he assigned a, a very important man in his government, Ashpenaz, to oversee this, 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 uh, this education program for these Israelite exiles. So he's a very important man in Nebuchadnezzar's government. Now the word that's uh, translated, uh, presented, it's correctly translated, it's the word bow, it's in the Hiphal stem, and it means to present because this word denotes that Ashpenaz, uh, it denotes Ashpenaz introducing Daniel and his three companions into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. So the, uh, and the word them again is Hamar, uh, uh, speaking of Daniel and his three companions. The word paneh, means presence, and it's employed with a preposition lamed, which is a marker of location, and together they mean in the presence of. So this indicates to us that after the three-year formal training program in the Babylonian education for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were brought into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar by Ashpenaz. This was a very big and solemn moment at this particular time. You, uh, uh, Babylonians would love to be in uh, the, the Babylonians uh, person who was in the Babylonian kingdom uh, people would love to be in this position that Daniel was brought into and uh, they, would, they would be it's a very, uh, very prestigious thing to be brought into the presence of the king of Babylon at this particular time who was the most powerful man in the world uh, you can equate it today uh, being brought into the presence president of the United States and I know some people who are Republicans won't think that's a great honor but it is a great honor. Uh, it is a great honor because of the office, of the, the highest uh, office in the land, and to be whether you like the person in the office is irrelevant. It's just, the, it's just to be in the presence of the, great, the most powerful man in the world, leader in the world, and it is, is a great honor. And uh, I remember one time uh, uh, somebody was, uh, when, I, when I sang for President Bush back in 2004 when he was running for re-election, you know, there were, there were some people in my family that don't like him, and uh, so they, they didn't think it was a big deal, you know, that I, I sang, uh, you know, for the President of the United States, you know, at one of his uh, the rallies there. Well, I, I said, well, it's the President of the United States, so I don't really, you know, it, it's an honor to have done it, and I would have done it again if I, I was given the chance. And, uh, you know, I don't really care who's the, the person who's in office. It's just the, the fact to, sit, to be in the presence of, uh, you know, someone, it's a prestigious thing to have happen to you. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar, being in the presence of Nebuchadnezzar at that time was very prestigious. It was a very uh, a powerful moment for these, you know, they're very young men. They're probably 20, 21 at this point because they, uh, you know, they, they finished the three-year training program. So they're about 20, 21 at this time. So they, here they are, young men, and they're being brought in, and they're brilliant, and they're being brought in to the presence of Nebuchadnezzar, and then he's going to interview them, which must have been nerve-wracking, I would think. But for these four guys, probably not, because they had, they you know probably said a prayer and uh, that God would help them through it, and that's why one of the reasons why they were so good in the interview with Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar, again, he's the second ruler of the Chaldean dynasty of Babylon, Nebo Pelasar was his father, he was the first one. Now, let's, uh, let's uh, bring out a few things about this passage as we close. Uh, Daniel 1.18, and Daniel 1.18 records that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah completed the three-year training program in Babylonian literature and language. Verses 3-5 through five records that Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz, his officials commanded, to transport members of the royal family as well as some of the nobles in Judea. The king wanted young Israelite men who had no physical defects and were handsome, as we read. They were also to be well-educated and possessing skill in every branch of wisdom. They were to possess the ability to, to discern secret knowledge. They were to be trained in the language and literature of the Babylonians, and this would qualify them to enter into serving as, Nebuch as a dignitary in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Now, Daniel 1.5, as we've read, says that this was to be a three-year training program. Now, those who meet the qualifications listed in verse 4 would be trained in the Babylonian culture, mathematics, astrology, astronomy, science, agriculture, philosophy, medicine, military history and tactics, Babylonian history, as well as training in Babylonian government and law. Now, upon completion of this three-year program, these, three, these four young men would, uh, along with the other Israelite exiles, would be brought into Nebuchadnezzar's presence and would serve him 
as, as dignitaries. Now, this was a great thing here that God was doing here. See, what, this, this is what's going on here. God is, as I bring down, started to bring out last evening, God is going to use these four young men. They're young. Four young men to bring glory to himself. Remember we read last evening, they were given all kinds of talent. They had knowledge that other, uh, in, in various areas of learning, that their contemporaries that took part in this training program did not have. They were especially gifted like Daniel, who could uh, had the ability to discern, uh, discern uh, visions and dreams. So these men, uh, these four young men, had a great opportunity to affect, make an, a mark for God in this particular situation. He was, God was going to use these four young men to do great things for him. Now, there are some people that think that God can't use young men. I read my Bible. There are so many young men throughout the Bible, like David, Daniel, and his, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Jeremiah was a young man. These were young, young people who did great things for God. They did great things for God. So what we see here is that age is not a factor. It's availability. Age is not a factor in serving God and making a mark for God and glorifying God. It's who wants to make themselves available. So, uh, we, uh, so serving the Lord, uh, learning his word, putting it into practice, serving him, and it doesn't matter what your age is. Your age is irrelevant. What matters is your availability. Are you positive to the word of God? Are you available for God's purposes? And uh, this is what we see Daniel and his three companions are doing. They're, they're making themselves available to be used by God. God's honored their faith and obedience. God's honored their faithfulness, as we saw. And now God is going to do mighty things through these, these individuals. And they got, they're, putting in a, they're being put in this position by God. This is the thing I've been trying to bring out and will continue to bring out in the book of Daniel, is that God is sovereign. God, remember, God, one of his attributes is sovereignty. That means when God says he's going to do something, he can do it, and he's not accountable or answerable to anybody. He does what he pleases. He's the only being in the universe that's like that. The creator is like that. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are sovereign. And in their sovereignty, they have decreed that Daniel and his three companions would be representing them. The Trinity would be represented by these four young men in a court of a Babylonian, a heathen king. So God was going to use these four young men to reach this heathen king. And he ends up getting saved. And there's a whole bunch of things that go on that convinced Nebuchadnezzar. One, he, had to, he, he ends up going for seven years, losing his mind and acting like an animal and thinking like an animal and has the king, uh, kingdom taken away from him for seven years. And at the end of that, he, he finally uh, acknowledges that God is sovereign over his life and he, has, it, it, and he praises God for it. And he became a believer. But Dan, and who was instrumental in that? God was using Daniel and these three young men. These three young men. And one of the great things I liked when I was at uh, GBC and I used to teach in the prep school is I love teaching the prep school because it was great because the young people, unlike adults many times, not all the time, but adults have a lot of baggage than, than young people. And I, it used to be great because the young people would be so positive and they would take it in and they would tell me what they were doing in school and their life and the people they were witnessing to. And it was just great. They had just no hang-ups. They, uh, they, were, they were not uh, hindered by anything. They weren't self-conscious. They weren't uh, wrapped up in themselves. They didn't have any baggage from a previous you know, uh, 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 place that they used to go to church and the church screwed them over or they got all messed up or something. They didn't have that baggage. They were just open to hear the word of God and received it and then put it into practice. And it was exciting to watch God use those young people. And a lot of these people, young people are now grown up. One of them is a secretary for a pastor somewhere. And there's another one is, one was in uh, Iraq. I know several of them went to, in the military and uh, they did really well there. And, uh, you know, now they're doing, there's successes in different areas, but they have that, they had that love for the Lord, which is great. And I hope they continue to have that. But that was a great 
great time in my life because it was great to see, you know, to be training these young people to serve the Lord. It was a great honor, and it was exciting to watch these young people serve God. And a lot of uh, adults, they have a lot of problems. They have a lot of difficulties, and their biggest problem is they have, they're in love with the world. They get caught up with the world. They, get, they let the world wear them down. The cosmic system is Satan, where the kids haven't got enough time in the cosmic system to be worn down. And I'm sure that some of them may be getting worn down. I still pray for them all the time. These young people now they're all, you know the young adults, but because what, what happens to adults is they get they get worn down by the world. The world sucks all the life out of them, and that should not be the case if they're if they're in prayer with the Lord and they're paying attention to what the scriptures are saying and putting it into practice in their life. Those who trust in the Lord will will get uh, will be reinvigorated by God when you w- trust in the Lord. So uh, young people have a uh, can be used mightily by God. I, I was reading. Uh, my, I read daily scripture, and I'll you know, for instance, I'm reading through. Last year, I did I read the Net Bible translation all the way through, and I'm doing the ESV, and uh, then uh, next year I'll do the NIV. But uh, I'm reading Jeremiah right now. And Jeremiah is one of my favorite characters. He was a young man, and he was so he was persecuted by his own people. He was uh, he was a, a man basically on an island. With God, which is not that bad, but when you with God, but he went through a lot of turmoil. This young man, he was a young, young guy, and he did great things for God. And he was someone who stood in the gap at a time of great apostasy in Israel. And we're seeing uh, Daniel. Uh, he re- he read from Jeremiah, and so Jeremiah was another young man. That and Daniel, he is a young man, and Jeremiah was a young man. And here's God using these people. It's kind of interesting. W- what about the Exodus generation? Uh, Exodus generation, all the adults died the sin unto death because of their lack of faith and their complaining. The children of the Exodus generation went into the promised land with Joshua. So they were, and Joshua was a young guy. And so, again, the young people. So uh, the, uh, that's so important that we, uh, we you know, and I used to uh, uh, take great pride when he, you know, hearing young people, you know, seeing young people into the Word of God, I used to try to show them off to the to, to Bob, you know, and you know, ask them questions, and then they knew more about the than some of the adults did. Not because I was a better teacher, but the, because they were more positive than they were, even their own parents were, which was quite amazing. And uh, but you know, it it just goes to show you. So uh, it, we have Daniel is has an opportunity to make a mark for God, and his three companions, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They do as well. They make great. They make a great uh, impression uh, in, uh, in in Nebuchadnezzar's court. We got time. Uh, hold, uh, look at your. Uh, hold your place. Don't hold your place. Go to Daniel chapter two. Let me show you just in the next subsequent chapters how they make a mark for God, even though they're young people. About twenty twenty one. Watch what they do. Look at Daniel chapter two. Look at verse 1. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call on the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. And it says that uh, to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king and the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans actually refers to astrologers. We'll note that when we get there. They are the spokesmen for the other three. Spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. And the king replied to the Chaldeans, The command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn from limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered a second time and said, let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will declare the interpretation. Basically, tell us what the dream was and then we'll, make up the, we'll have the interpretation. Of course, he knows they're trying to make it up. They're going to make it up. So he's saying, no, you tell me what I dreamed. Okay, so he's smart here because he thinks these guys are phonies. Now, I'm, I'm, we're leading up to what Daniel's going to come into the picture here and make a mark for God and make a great imp- and glorify God and manifest God's power and wisdom and uh, omniscience uh, uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 8, the king replied, I know for certain that you're bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that the command for me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed, until I change my mind, and I'm not going to. Therefore, tell me the dream. 
that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. And they called in, answered the king, and said, There is not a man on earth, and this is true, who could declare the matter for the king. Finally, they're telling the truth. Inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Magician, uh, conjurer, and Chaldean. He's talking about, they're actually uh, talking about, ast- Chaldeans is an astrologer. Uh, magician is an occult priest, actually. And conjurer is a necromancer, someone who communicates with the dead. Verse 11. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. And there's no one else who could declare it to the king except God's whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Little do they know that God has his own man ready there to come through for him and glorify him, to manifest God's presence to Nebuchadnezzar by interpreting his dream. Look at verse 12. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Kill them. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Now remember, he's, uh, th- 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 this Daniel and his three companions are part of the dignitaries, the part of the government, which compo- is composed of astrologers, necromancers, occult priests, and uh, in, 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 in the uh, kingdom here. So he goes on to say in verse 14, Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He's the executioner. And he said to Arioch, the king's commander, For what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter, matter, so so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men. They're going to have a prayer meeting is what they did. They prayed over it and God gave them the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which only Nebuchadnezzar would know, and he also gave, God gave him the interpretation of the dream. Remember, God gave Daniel this ability to do this, but they also prayed here before they uh, got the, inter- the content and the interpretation of the dream. Now look at verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, and then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and and knowledge to men of understanding. And it says in verse 22, and it is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we have requested of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel, now watch how Daniel is going to glorify God here. He's ready. He's being prepared by God. Now he's got his chance. Verse 24, therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and spoke to him as follows. Follows, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Now, these guys are involved in the occult. They're communicating with demons. Yet Daniel doesn't have them executed. Take me into the king's presence and I will declare the interpretation to the king. And then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. And the king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered before the king. Now here's where he's going to glorify God. He's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king at this time, who is going, who, who the God of heaven is. Who's the, true, the living, true and living God? It's the God of Israel. So he says in verse 27, he has his opportunity. He doesn't mess up. He, he says in verse 27, Daniel, Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. You, O king, were looking 
And behold, there was a single great statue. He's telling them the content of his dream. Only God, who's omniscient, could tell this. But Daniel's been given this ability by God. And this is manifesting God's power and wisdom and omniscience to Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king. This is going to be another, it was one of the first steps to Nebuchadnezzar getting saved. And who was he using God using? A young man, 20, 21 years of age. It's not, it's not how uh, God, if you're available, he will use you. Whether you're 14 years old, 13 years old, or 21, if or you're 55 or 80. He's going to use you if you want to be, if you make yourself available to him. So it goes on to say, in uh, verse 31, you, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue, that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed it and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now that's the content of his dream. Everybody in the court must have been astonished, and Nebuchadnezzar, his eyes must have been popping out of his head because of this. Then it says in verse 36, now I'm going to give you the interpretation, Daniel says. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. Notice that Daniel saying to Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king, you get your power from my God. Look at verse 38. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will arise another kingdom, inferior to you. Then another third kingdom, a bronze, which will rule over all the earth, as we'll see. Medo Persia followed Babylon, that took, it defeated Babylon. And after Medo Persia, we have Alexander's Greece. And after Alexander's Greece, the fourth kingdom is Rome. It says in verse uh, 40 Then there will be a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, that's what Rome did, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it, this fourth kingdom, will crush and break all these in pieces. And that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. He's describing the revived form of the Roman Empire that will be around during the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. Verse 43, And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. They will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. That means the, United, the, the revived form of the Roman Empire will be United States of Europe, and it will not be a, as solid as the Roman Empire was because it will have... Uh, people from different ethnic backgrounds uh, joining together and thus it will not be strong as if they were all the same race. And so it goes on to say in verse 44, and the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms but it will s itself endure forever. So he's saying that Jesus Christ at his second advent will establish his millennial reign, which will end the times of the Gentiles, which Daniel has been describing. Now look at verse 45. Inasmuch as you saw that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so the, the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Daniel is manifesting the omniscience and the sovereignty and wisdom of God and the power of God here, by proclaiming this dream and its interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar. He's a young man. Don't forget that. He's a young man. Why did I bring you to this passage? Because I'm showing you that Daniel was brought into a place of uh, uh, significance in, in a government where he was um, uh, the most powerful world government at that time. And Daniel and his three companions, who were about 20, 21, were being brought into the presence of this king. And thus they had a great opportunity to evangelize him. And they do. They were given the opportunity here 
by God. Now look at the reaction of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. And the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you've been able to reveal this mystery. So Daniel was used by God to bring glory to himself. And who, received, who praised him? This heathen king praised Daniel and the, his God that he worshipped. And again, he's only 20, 21 years of age. Verse 48, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him great, uh, many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And again, that's great opportunity, a great platform for Daniel. He's going to be in a great position where he could uh, make an impact among these, these people who are high up in Babylonian government. He can make, and he's already made an impact because everybody would have heard of this. His promotion would have made clear that everyone who in Babylon and his kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, had heard of this. What a great impact Daniel was being used by God. And all Daniel had to do was tell, uh, communicate to Nebuchadnezzar what God told him to communicate to the king. Now verse 49 says, And Daniel made request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. So there we have, uh, we have uh, Daniel being, uh, making a great impact for God. And here he is. He's only 19, uh, 20, 21 years of age. He made himself available. He's in a great opportunity, a great position. And he did, not, he did not blow it. He took advantage of it and glorified God before this heathen king. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time, this study of word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with the things that we've heard and uh, encourage us and strengthen us and instruct us and rebuke us if necessary. We pray that this lesson would bring glory to you and your son and minister to the body of Christ. And our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.